first of all please accept my warm welcome our esteemed panelists who whole i really thank you wholeheartedly today to be here to share your first hand experience with us in public safety and how you identify your role uh, the role of technology in law enforcement we here we have uh, david bernabi with us staff sergeant provincial police academy ontario provincial police force he has 22 plus years of experience with government of ontario as a public safety and correctional services field training hostage negotiation school safety community safety crime scene coordination i think i can go on and on and on but i will give david some time to introduce himself uh, later next we have tim johnson with us a uh, safety security specialist retired law enforcement he has spent 30 plus years as a public safety professional tim is air force veteran retired law enforcement officer a uh, consultant community outreach professional and i'm sure he has a lot to share with us here today next we have job philip with us he's ceo of cert ai he spent 14 years working in investment strategy in financial sector um including positions in icici venture kotak mahindra and yes bank and to finally um, in 2019 explore his passion for ai human collaboration uh, and i uh, i feel he's been loving every day since job is mba from uh, iim lucknow and btech from iit bombay unfortunately kc rides will not be able to join us today for some personal reasons but i hope um, kc will be with us in our next webinar which will be pretty soon i guess so back to today today's agenda uh david uh, i uh, i have a question um, as a crisis negotiator how challenging can it be to talk down an armed hostage taker and ensure public safety officer safety and uh, resource protection i uh hi rashmi thank you very much for having me here i appreciate the uh, the invite um Hello to the other panelists as well, Tim, Joe. Very thank you for uh, for having me here. Um, it, it's a great question, and I think crisis negotiating is a very uh, it's a difficult uh, difficult problem at times. Uh, there can be so many factors um, that play into a, a, a peaceful resolution. Uh, you're dealing with human behavior and uh, human factors, uh, and establishing. Um, establishing motive oftentimes is very difficult but uh, essential to a peaceful resolution uh scene management is takes paramount so uh, if you're talking about public safety officer safety resource protection um the scene management as an incident commander um which in, in, encompasses all of those things which uh, so that that would be a, a major factor uh, when it comes to Uh, how challenging it can to be dealing specifically with an armed hostage taker um so that uh, it 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 really encompasses on a lot of what if questions so the you know if if you're looking at overall tactics and the use of uh establishing rapport so communication um coupled with uh tactical options such as uh the use of technology um to determine how how truthful someone is being when they're when they're speaking to you if you don't have actual eyes on that person um those are all factors that come into a decision when when uh, uh dealing with a, a crisis negotiator or someone who's contaminated thought uh regardless of when you're trying to deal with someone who is in crisis um the the framework of that person the the mind um you need you need to be able to establish some type of rapport and typically in order to do that you you have to be rationally thinking so um that's the ultimate goal uh sometimes tactical options are the best option and and uh most times communication is involved in all of that so it can be very complex and there's a lot of what if questions so i'm not sure if i answered that question uh in its totality there but uh how challenging can it be it, it can be very challenging depending on the circumstances hostage numbers uh where it is motive of the uh hostage taker um the ability framework mind framework of where that person is their experiences their skill set um there's a lot of factors that come into that for sure 
Thank you so much, David. Uh, job, they say, uh, react before shots are fired. I think that that's the quickest way to uh, explain what weapon detection is all about. So uh, do you mind elucidating how AI could be used to detect guns before shooting actually happens? So when Dave was uh, mentioning about the post-state takedown situation, I was just wondering, uh, where exactly are we? Is there anything uh, even remotely close to uh, where the artificial part of intelligence uh, can be applied in that? I, I, I honestly think it's far off today, uh, especially talking to the point that uh, Dave was mentioning. Uh, because in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, uh, it, the probabilities and uh, you know the confidence, etc., doesn't matter. Uh, they match up when we are talking about large number of uh, uh, you know kind of events out of which you can you can predict that these are the number of events which an AI would predict. These are the number of correct decisions that it will take. Uh, while Dave's job is uh, you know in a one-on-one -on -one scenario to manage that situation, uh, you know uh, the uh, the things that he just mentioned. Uh, there the where the AI today is wanting, uh, right? Uh, because it's a one-on-one -on -one hostage situation. There is not much that AI can bring to the table. It depends on the years and years of experience that they have had on some of those things. Having said that, the paradigm where, uh, where AI works is, um, you know, kind of situation where there are a large number of events. You want to predict uh, or you want to ascertain those events before they happen. Uh, kind of relay back the intelligence onto the chief, onto the people who can take decision on that, right? Uh, the first step uh, today on some of this is actually the detection part of it. Uh, you know, before any of those situations arise, if detection uh, or the tracking of the detected object thereof uh, is something that the experts believe uh, should be done, that is the area where instead of having years of experience of Tim and Dave and people like them, uh, which is not as entirely scalable proposition, uh, that is the area where, uh, where uh, an AI can help. It can relay back those, uh, those things, uh, you know, kind of give first signals to, uh, you know, uh, to the people who are supposed to take that decision that this is, uh, this is happening, this is supposed to happen, or this is possibly the predicted uh, scenario with the reasonable confidence that uh, you know this or this is can happen uh, but then to take on it to act on it uh, that is not a, not a case where ai uh, you know today can help uh, uh, you know even remotely uh, but the only only thing is uh, once you apply ai into any of the situations and if it is given enough chance to learn on it there is an enough sanctity of the data being collected which is used to train that ai yes uh, even some of the decision making can be logically over a period of time, gradually uh, uh, be, you know, kind of given in the hands of AI. But today, uh, the main thrust of AI would be to detect, track, and to relay back the information on which some actionable things can happen. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Uh, we haven't heard Tim until now. So Tim, sometimes the mere presence of firearms can make people feel threatened in for their lives and you know feel that uh, psychological effects. So will weapon detection help diminish that fear and uh, make individuals and whole communities feel safer and protected? Tim, are you there with us? If you are on mute. Say, say that one more time, Rashmi, please. Sure. Uh, so uh, my question is, sometimes the mere presence of firearms around uh, make people feel threatened for their lives uh, and have severe psychological effects. So do you think a weapon detection will diminish that fear in them and make those individuals and whole communities feel safer and protected? Um, I think you're right. And uh, real quick, uh, David, good presentation. As a uh, fellow field training officer and hostage negotiator, you covered that very well. Um, and thank you, Job and Rosme, for having me today. Uh, uh, knowing that there are firearms around does play a psychological um, aspect of, you know, at, say at any kind of event or any kind, uh, in schools, uh, in, in facilities, buildings, wherever it may be, Knowing that the mere fact that the firearms are in there, um, there are certain people that are going to 
you know, have a reaction, uh, maybe a psychological reaction of fear of that firearm uh, being being known and so forth. Um, I think what we see is you know, with uh, the artificial intelligence part as far uh, prior detection, knowing uh, it does give us a good advance warning that, okay, we could watch this subject. Um, and then it comes down to, as we've had our discussions, you know, in the United States, as far as having contact with that individual, uh, do they have a right to carry that firearm under the Second Amendment of our Constitution? And then also under the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution, do we have a right to, uh, as a law enforcement, to um, you know, search that individual or address that person to take that firearm away from them? So those things we have to you know, take into consideration when this comes about. But for the, the, for the fear of, um, could, it, could it maybe escalate people knowing um, you know, that there's someone in the crowd that, that's carrying firearms that don't need to? I, it, from my experience and the things I've seen, it does create a lot of conflict. Uh, it does create, uh, you know, a pejorative con uh, contact with, you know, um, people in the crowd as far as, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, communicating, you know, um, at a sporting event. Uh, most likely, you're probably not going to get into a sporting event. We've set up our, uh, our security now at different events with uh, metal detectors, uh, you know, firearms, uh, looking for weapons and so forth. And then we also use uh, the artificial intelligence ahead of time. A lot of our facilities do now uh, checking people as they're coming towards the gate it will actually detect whether they have the firearm and then we do a uh, facial recognition and some other things too but I, th I think you're right on with the psychological part of the effect that it plays on people um, whether they may want to or may not want to uh, attend events um, go to school go to church go shopping uh, so it plays a lot on society as a whole and we're seeing that here uh, in my home state of Ohio, we've just passed a law for firearms to be in schools uh, by the school teachers carrying the firearm uh, with very little to no training. Uh, to me, uh, it's kind of like giving the janitor, instead of a fire extinguisher, you give the janitor a can of gas to put the fire out. So I'm not sure how well this is going to go over. It's very new. Uh, it's just being implemented. There's a lot of pushback, um, as, as you said, Rosham. Um, the fear of most of the students in the school and the parents and teachers and so forth themselves just don't want that to happen. So it's something we're gonna, I think we're gonna deal with, but yeah, prior detection, I think it's really a good idea. Can I just uh, you know, add, on, add a few things on that? Sure, sure, please go ahead. So, uh, you know, when uh, Dave mentioned about uh, school teachers getting fire, being given firearms, et cetera, those are some of the things which we, you know, kind of sitting million miles uh, away we really don't understand uh, how some of the things uh, are supposed to work, right? It's it's not that, uh, you know, when we hear of firearms that the society doesn't work. It works, you know, kind of maybe much better than how it works in India, right? Where we don't have firearms, right? So so first of all, uh, when we talk about uh, the gun violence, etc., it's not that we are talking about a society which doesn't work. It works. So uh, in a society where it where it works, some of the changes, uh, of course, has to be gradual be it technological changes or be it, uh, uh, you know, kind of changes that uh, Tim mentioned about, right? Uh, uh, that creating an army of uh, people who have, who have no business to be in that, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, interesting parallel, uh, you know, if you stretch back, uh, uh, you know, I, I will uh, I'll talk about how the technology at least uh, shaped an industry which, uh, you know, which today is considered much safer. So, uh, go back 30, 40 years, uh, airline travel wasn't as safe as, as, as uh, uh, it today is. Um, and it was the time of, uh, you know, when, when, when people thought that taking away control from pilots uh, means uh, heading to a disaster. Uh, but the change was so gradual, uh, you know, it first came by A320s, uh, by fly-by-wire technologies, etc. It was so gradual that can we collect more and more data on what exactly is going wrong, right? Uh, so instead of... Uh, uh, instead of maybe just thinking about an actionable uh, event on day one, can we just collect how many schools, uh, you know, have people coming with weapons, uh, you know, are there, are there some sort of uh, experts who can look into that data and kind of make some analysis that, that these are the areas where, uh, you know, I need to be more vigilant about and hence use technology. These are the areas where I, I've always had a blind spot and I don't have another team who, you know, knows as much as me. So can I train some of this stuff to do? AI and have an AI which is a scalable part or a part of Tim 
uh, you know, being deployed at that and it's uh, beaming back the information, right? Now, those are the stuff uh, which is what I mean when we talk about uh, gradual changes, right? Uh, give it enough time. Uh, you know, uh, hundreds of years have passed uh, with the Second Amendment uh, and the society has worked fine. It's not that you need to change everything, but can it be used for at least getting the data, at least getting data in the right hands so that they can make informed decision on what needs to be done with that data? Yes. Uh, we have a parallel, uh, 30, or, you know, again, as I was mentioning, the A320s. Uh, from that time, we're having two computers, two, um, you know, today, and, you know, kind of everything works on autopilot. And, and that has only made pilot's job that much more important. Uh, that has expanded the scope because anything which, uh, you know, can touch upon the safety and the important uh, parameters of that particular industry, which in a full, um, you know, safety has to be, you know, kind of maintained. But whether uh, just having system for the sake of it increases uh, the safety factor, maybe not. Um, you know, there was uh, an event uh, in Boston where I see that, uh, you know, some of these technologies were used. Uh, I don't know which event, uh, but I just read through these back. Um, but they created a zone, uh, and that was a nice way of doing that this is the zone where they, the guns won't be allowed. Anybody entering into that zone had the normal, uh, uh, you know, kind of checking going on, as well as the computer vision. Uh, the computer vision's job was to, you know, kind of alert uh, the people on hundreds of things, of which only 10 would be actionable. Uh, but at least instead of thousands, can you narrow it down to hundreds? In an area where you have defined that this is going to be a gun-free gun -free zone, uh, for whatever reasons uh, have you, right? Uh, so it is in that perspective that I think about some of these changes. I really believe that, uh, you know, only the detection on areas where it is paramount is the only thing that, uh, you know, when we talk about or try to even preach <laughs> uh, to, uh, you know, US people should ideally do, we should, uh, we are not in their shoes. Uh, but once they have decided that these are some of the changes that over a period of time we need to make a gradual uh, you know, change by starting with detection and tracking uh, and collection, collection of that data, maybe that would be the first logical step in my mind. Uh, Tim, uh, do, you, do you agree with uh, this broad assessment? You asking me? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, ask, ask that question one more time. Uh, would you agree with this broad assessment uh, that gradually, uh, you know, the role of technology to create a scalable portion uh, and to get collect the data on which actionable insights can be drawn out later? Is that a way which you would advocate? Uh, yeah, uh, data collection is great for, um, I think, everything that we're discussing here to bring to the table. Um, we definitely need that, you know, from uh, old methodologies to uh, new technology. Uh, I think, you know, combining those together, you know, as a collaboration of the two and then uh, extracting, you know, what's going to be the best to uh, implement for programs and so forth. But uh, I, th I think I think you're right on with what you're after, um, you know, as far as uh, introducing the two for, uh, prior detection of, of anything, you know, gives us a, a chance, um, you know, a, a warning of, of understanding of what might happen. It's just kind of like what David touched on with hostage negotiation. Um, the intel that we get is paramount. Um, if we're not getting correct intel, uh, it could lead to, you know, a, a disaster for us, um, a loss in what we're trying to uh, connect to. And so I think that, yeah, I think you're right on track with, um, you know, trying to, you know, collect the data as what's going on out there, you know, apply it to uh, old and new and then extract something out of there and implement that. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, they say it's what you do with the intelligence that really changes the outcome. Right. David, would you like to add something to this? Uh, I, I think uh, both uh, Job and, and Tim have done a great job of explaining that. Uh, intel gathering uh, is crucial um, when it comes to the mere presence of, of firearms and psychological effect on, on that. Um, it's difficult to say whether the detection of of uh, of of the firearm would actually reduce the psychological effect um, because um, small increments. So there's a lot of research that suggests that small little increments of uh, 
people that have phobias on whatever, let's uh, pick an elevator, for example, that uh, if you expose that person gradually to an elevator, that they start to uh, become a little bit more comfortable around them. So uh, education, proper education, um, oftentimes it's not the, uh, well, all times, it's not the firearm itself that's causing the problem. It's the person that wielding the, the firearm that is the issue. Uh, so certainly in, in, uh, in, uh, in the proper context, public gatherings, uh, protests, uh, which are part of our democratic process, is being able to uh, protest. Uh, but certainly, uh, within those within those environments, there can be uh, extremists, and uh, those are that type of intel gathering of uh, of people who are there to cause, uh, you know, mass casualty in. Uh, you know, outside of the realm of, of, you know, the, 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 whatever the protest may be about um, is, is certainly valuable information. So then lawful authorities can, can move and act on that kind of uh, information. So that's, yeah. Intel gathering is crucial for sure. That's right. Uh, thanks. Job. Meanwhile, could you quickly explain how is this weapon detection thing actually done? What is the technology behind it and how accurate is it? Yeah, uh, so, uh, so yes, uh, you know, uh, before I go deeper into it, it's not a great, uh, you know, technological unknown today. Uh, you know, a few years back, uh, I, would, I would say that this is uh, an unknown and uh, somebody has to take a leap of faith that this would work. Uh, today it works uh, with a robust degree of accuracy. We as a company, uh, you know, do that uh, pretty well. Um, the, uh, the uh, you know, basic idea is, uh, you know, if you have a good training data uh, and if you have good uh, algorithms behind it, uh, you can train almost uh, anything for detection, right? Uh, uh, so if, if you have a good set of data uh, on, the, on the gun side, weapon side, or whatever else have you, uh, the detection model today can work with uh, as, as high a degree of accuracy as you want. Uh, then it's on people to decide what type of, uh, uh, you know, uh, area do they want to err on. Uh, do, if 100 people are carrying a uh, firearm, do you want 110 alerts so that uh, somebody can check on those 110 and come back to that these are the 100 who are carrying. Uh, so there is 10 who are uh, like false positive. Or do you want to uh, err on the other side uh, that everyone who is detected, um, you know, is actually carrying a weapon. So it's so instead of 100, you will get only 90, but all 90 of them will be carrying a weapon. Now that is uh, left to the, uh, you know, kind of what is the solution that people are looking after, uh, right? Uh, but that is kind of the only variable uh, when we talk about uh, a detection and tracking technology today. Uh, uh, you know, as soon as that variable is fit, uh, it will work with, uh, you know, in kind of most of the scenarios, and of course, where the cameras are available. Um, but going beyond that, uh, once we once we've done that, uh, the role today, uh, you know, as I as I explained earlier, also should only be passed on that data to experts who give the advice because that is a technological unknown. Uh, that is an area which uh, not only us but anyone uh, proposing to enter into on the uh, on the prediction slash the actual intelligence part of it uh, would be found lacking, uh, and errors would be made. Uh, the only good part is, uh, you know, those are some of the simulations that can be done. Uh, uh, you know, the role of uh, David and Tim uh, is on real life, right? Uh, the the good part about AI is any of the things you can simulate. You can have hundreds and hundreds of simulation. The data that is collected on it uh, is fed into somebody uh, or an algorithm which doesn't have a bias or a noise. Uh, you know, the noise can be reduced by having more and more data. So the bias. Inherent bias uh, is always non-existent, except the bias that has been fed on by the trainer itself, uh, right? Uh, so hundreds and hundreds of simulations can be done. Over a period of time, it can be taught to do a fraction of what experts are doing, uh, but the initial set of uh, data gathering to, uh, you know, kind of having that data, uh, which can be acted upon, that part is robust enough. Uh, it is something that uh, anyone wanting to uh, you know, kind of apply in their workplace to uh, schools, etc. That can be done uh, without much of a problem. 
So how is it done? Uh, we don't mind a security personnel carrying a, a weapon and we don't want uh, an alert to be triggered when you spot a security person. Um, but somebody who is not in the uniform, uh, we just want alerts for that. Is it possible to train the model? Yeah, enough? yeah, 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 absolutely. So, uh, you know, the rule of thumb today on AI is whatever your eyes can see, uh, suppose you don't have a brain, but whatever your eyes can see, uh, that can be mimicked. Uh, so, for example, when we see a security guard, we know based on their uniform, etc., that it's the security guard. He or she is supposed to uh, carry weapons and these are the type of weapons that he or she is supposed to carry. Um, having that data, having that, uh, you know, kind of fed onto the uh, algorithm which will do the detection, uh, you can get a model which eliminates some of these, uh, you know, kind of uh, cases. Um, uh, but then, uh, uh, give somebody wearing the security uniform and coming, then you have a different set of uh, problem. Then you can do facial recognition. It's not that none of these uh, challenges today are insurmountable. Uh, you know, in the last at least four years, uh, since there has been a lot of hardware advancement as well, uh, which has helped, uh, you know, kind of kept pace with the software. Uh, bigger software, better software, and better algorithms, etc., which is happening. Uh, these challenges, as long as there is a proper way of solving it, is uh, can be done. Uh, but uh, as I say again and again, that uh, AI still has to be looked at in terms of large number of events happening, predicting most of them accurately, uh, rather than attacking each individual items and trying to you know kind of get a, get the best out of it. Uh, that still is not an area which means. Uh, lesser number of data, uh, uh, things which they go through, uh, those are not the situations which are ideal for an AI, but with large number of data, uh, you know, it can be trained to do anything and make a prediction which works on large number of data, again, because it's a probability at the end of it. All right. Thank you. Uh, David and Tim, do you have any questions for Job here? No, I think it's uh, uh, fantastic. Um, uh, the uh, the use of technology is um, it's gradually uh, being utilized amongst law enforcement and military uh, more and more. I mean, it's um, it's the new age. Uh, so it would be silly not to incorporate uh, this new uh, knowledge uh, within tactics. Um, uh, previous tactics and then modify our tactics uh, so it's better utilized um, once again it comes down to intelligence gathering and and, the, and then how you use that intelligence uh, facial recognition uh, understanding characteristics of an armed person uh, those those human factors those human behavior um, that side of the, the psychology side of of the house and then couple that with um, real-time intelligence uh, based on IT, uh, based on uh, technology, AI. Uh, it's, um, you know, now an informed uh, incident commander can can decide on what steps to take. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, relying too much on one thing is never a good thing. Um, and I think that's uh, sometimes causes some uh, mistakes within, um, within the law for sure uh, i mean that's what i can i can speak to uh, but if you have a multitude of of uh of branches of information coming to you um, that's always a good thing and then uh, you can decide collectively with your team uh best route and course of action uh, so uh, uh, pretty interesting one there because when you were speak uh, when you're saying that's when i Realize that it's not only on uh, reducing um, uh, the incidents or improving safety. What happens is once the software is ready, right, it is scalable uh, to an extent that uh, you know we as a human being are it, right. But to get a level of understanding that you have, um, you had years and years of experience. You had years and years of uh, you know kind of dealing with the same situation, right. Uh, now suppose the AI, uh, at least on the detection tracking and a bit of intelligence side, right? If it can be trained, now you you can deploy that in areas where you are not present uh, without any cost, right? So if if there are hundred cities in in US which are say properly monitored, uh, a fraction of that monitoring can be taught to AI, deployed across the across the country uh, without incurring any cost at all. Uh, 
that is the huge advantage, right? Uh, and you know, what do you do with that data? That data can come to the experts uh, who can then you know kind of improve on the technology, improve on uh, what experts need to do with it. Uh, but the scalability part of it, once it is trained, the ability to deploy without any cost, uh, that's that's a huge advantage. So overall, uh, while it looks expensive to experiment with it, uh, but over a period of time, the, uh, the use of software or the mix of software and uh, uh, expertise uh, logically reduces cost by a huge bunch. Yeah, I think what I see in society is, you know, we're skeptical to change. Um, it's a given. Uh, in the military here in the U.S. is usually about 10 years ahead of society as a whole. Um, a lot of technology there that's not implemented in uh, you know, law enforcement across the country. But I think you know, David hit on a lot of things, and so do you as well, Job, is um, introducing things. I can say in the late uh, 90s, when uh, in the early 20s, you know, I started wearing a, a body camera uh, of my own choice whenever you know, I was out working the streets. And now we see across the country, law enforcement uh, departments are being ordered to wear a camera. Um, I wish back then that everybody in my department would have worn one, but it wasn't, you know, I bought it offline, a camera, and I tried it out, and, uh, you know, it covered me on a lot of different things. It was something I implemented. Um, I'm kind of skeptical to change as well, but the way I look at it, an old military term, my, one of my sergeants taught me was to, uh, when there's change, you learn to adapt, improvise, and overcome. And so, I mean, it's kind of like what we're doing now is we're just taking new technology and we're adding it in. And, uh, you know, with that, what we've been using forever, you know, I started out with the schools. Um, we had a lock on the front door and we put a camera on there to get buzzed in and out. And then uh, you see the technology as far as where we're, we're going to today with, the, you know, the AI and, uh, you know, metal detectors at doors and so forth like that. Um, it, it's very helpful. Um, Pre-detection of anything uh, allows somebody to think of, you know, what decision are they going to make? It's, you know, it's, it's a form of intel. And I, I think uh, I welcome it um, as hesitant as I may be at sometimes to, uh, you know, because I've, I've got that mentality of, am I violating somebody's rights? Uh, you know, being an American you know, in law enforcement, that's what you think. You know, I don't want to be violating somebody's rights. Um, and, you know, we look as, you know, don't mean to uh, uh, stay on the topic, but it comes down, you know, Second Amendment and Fourth Amendment all the time. Um, here, here in Central Ohio, uh, we have um, shots fired detectors. Uh, it's a sensor that sits on a light pole and they put them out in certain neighborhoods where there's high crime and problems. And when the it picks up, um, you know, gunshots, it notifies law enforcement. They get dispatched to that area. Sometimes they find something, sometimes they don't. But uh, it, it's, again, back to job, it's, it's the data. We're collecting data on that and we're starting to see things. Um, it allows us to... Uh, where do we want our resources to go? Where should they be? Well, we're getting a lot of shots fired over here. Um, so, we're, you know, we're also seeing as far as, you know, the facial recognition at most of the arenas, uh, sporting events and other places, the artificial intelligence and, um, you know, the gun detection, uh, somebody, the, the problem that we're running into in Ohio, it's a um, wild west here. We just recently passed law, our legislators you're allowed to not only open carry, but you can concealed carry. And there's no qualifications other than age. Uh, there's no certifications or, or, or anything. Um, I, I think people a lot of times are in fear. The reason they're carrying a firearm, they're in fear of what they may see in society, but they're reluctant to act because they don't under, actually understand what taking a life means. Uh, and we see that a lot in um, an incident in Texas. Uh, I think it was a Walmart. Uh, they, where they had the shooting, eight people within inside that store had firearms on them. Nobody pulled it out to use it. They were all afraid. Well, I, I didn't really mean to use it. I just wanted to carry it. We've seen the same thing right here in Dayton, Ohio, at a mass shooting at an outdoor event. Um, and you know, lucky for many, uh, law enforcement was right on the scene uh, within a, you know less than a minute because they were happen to be there doing special duty. So they took the individual out, but. Again, there were 20 some people that had firearms and they were all reluctant to, to pull that firearm out and use it for self-defense. But it's, and, and that, that comes down to the psychological spot uh, that we were talking about of, okay, you, you know, you have the ability and the right to carry it, but do you have the ability to use it and to deal with the repercussions, not only 
legally, but psychologically that you're going to deal with if you take someone's life. So, Very true, Tim. Uh, you know, interesting insights uh, because we, we miss out uh, by not being there uh, or that people are reluctant to use it. Uh, I never uh, realized, right? Uh, because uh, it's very easy to assume that it would be an instinct to use it uh, when somebody in front of you is using it. Uh, but then um, you know what you said uh, is is kind of very interesting. Um, so then um, you know how do you safeguard it? I I, I really don't know, right? It it comes on in the, you know do you have law enforcement at every place or do you try to have a mix of things which work well and gradually you know shift based on uh, how you see the pattern evolving? Uh, very interesting, very interesting, but makes for a you know, good food for thought and some of these insights. Right. Yeah, it can create mass confusion, and I'm sure David will agree. It, law enforcement uh, knowledge and experience and reaction, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, sure. we go through an academy, we go through college, we go through years of training. And as a field training officer, I used to tell my people that 10 years into the career, you'll start to learn what you're doing. You'll know what you're doing. But it takes that long to, you know, adapt to all of those skills and all those trades and so forth. It just doesn't happen. So just to take the average person, and let anybody and everybody carry firearms out on the street, you get into a situation and you just kind of touched on a lightly job was, you know, if one person pulls out a gun and starts shooting, will everybody else start? And who do you shoot? Hmm. You know, who is the shooter? Who is the bad guy? Who are the good people? So there's hmm. a lot in that that you have to hmm. play into factors and, uh, you know, training and so forth comes with that. Hmm. Yeah, so those are the areas that I don't think technology, you know, if a uh, if the person who is going to program it doesn't even understand uh, the nuances of it, right? How can the technology or the final product understand it, right? Uh, uh, so that is an area which is so far off, uh, but uh, the initial few areas on having at least some sort of detection, tracking, inside data, uh, you know, deploying it over a period of time, simulation, those are some of the stuff which today is possible and uh, I believe that would be the first logical step for most of the places to at least try it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Tim, do you think AI will ever be uh, able to, you know, replace uh, humans as efficiently as you've been doing the job all these years? Uh, I don't see that actually happening. Um, we're using robots right now uh, here, you know, in, in my uh, hometown. We use robot fire department. They use them for, you know, the bomb explosion division. Um, they use the robots to go over there. But uh, when it comes down to it, an actual human actually has to go over and do the work. Uh, and I, I see that artificial intelligence being uh, in a hostage situation to be able to, you know, run a robot into um, you know, into a building and, you know, maybe pick up some intel, you know, visual intel that we're not getting, uh, you know, from the outside. Uh, I see a lot of good use in it. Uh, we actually, law enforcement across the country is using uh, some high-tech companies, and I don't know, Job, you may have some insight on it. Um, it's robotic do dogs uh, that are, you know, they, that they're using for, um, to go into these hostage situations and so forth, or using them for, right now, it's more of an entertainment thing, but I can only imagine as we continue to research this, um, the use that those will provide. But uh, when it comes down to it, uh, if, if you got an armed situation, so we'll just use one of the schools um, and they're in there. Um, it's, you know, uh, artificial intelligence, I don't see them uh, de-escalating the, is the issue. Uh, I really don't see a armed suspect wanting to communicate with a robot. Um, uh, it's hard enough as a, as a person to communicate person to person to make sure that you don't say the wrong thing or you offer the wrong thing and then all of a sudden, you know, things uh, go away. But um, it's, as far as A&I, uh, I'm very much for it as far as the intel that it's going to bring to not just law enforcement, just first responders as a whole. Uh, the military, uh, you know, the U.S. military, we're, we're using it. Uh, we use it for a lot of things. Uh, and as it trickles down into normal everyday society, I think that just not in uh, public safety, but I think in other areas, um, we're going to see a lot of that employed and used, and it's going to be very useful. Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say never say never, 
but uh, you know i kind of echo uh, in sentiment uh, we are far from that right only 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 thing that's going on is uh, this technology is on an exponential growth curve uh, be it on the software side or hardware side and when things are on exponentially growing I and mean, improving all the time we really don't know what future brings right uh, but if i have uh, you know some insight i would say we are very far off from today, even with exponential growth on some of these things uh, where we where we are today is if the commands can be expressly given that this is the desired outcome that this is the desired insight intelligence uh, that somebody is looking at can you get me that desired intelligence or this is the desired outcome i know that this is the desired outcome and i want you to get that outcome um, can some of those things be managed yes uh, but to have the entire intelligence of something which is so uh, nuanced and experience based as a law enforcement um, i don't think we will we are anywhere close to that because how, we don't even know how to train a system to have that nuanced understanding uh, how to train a system to understand who is the shooter and who is not in a 10 member ball a simple example that you know uh, the top of uh, his mind that tim had right uh, i i really would struggle with uh, you know even defining how do you come up with a scenario where uh, where the ai even understands uh, what's going on i i, I really can't fathom it uh, so to that extent uh, you know taking all his years of experience and uh, putting it on a humanoid slash robot ai I think we are far off, uh, but uh, being in that field, uh, I want to see where it uh, where it goes, uh, and it is exponentially growing. That gives me that gives me a lot of hope that a lot of these things can happen. But I really don't see the role of experts uh, diminishing. In fact, it could increase because the amount of data and the amount of insights would be large. So somebody who is a real expert will stand out, uh, not because of years of experience, but because of his actual expertise. Uh, they have an you know kind of way to shine and uh, kind of educate the entire world and their insights and education would be the ones which would be fed onto ai which would make the entire system go through a spiral which will lead to better outcome for all so that is uh, you know what i would uh, emphasize yeah. yeah i'll agree with you uh, it a and i is a welcoming tool for a toolbox it's yeah. just of uh, the implementation of it and uh you know getting it to uh you know into the into the mainstream system um and we're seeing a lot of uh, robotic stuff now you know with the drones and so forth uh used in a variety of ways missing people lost children uh somebody if we you know you got somebody cornered off into a, a cornfield or whatever it may be you know a building or whatever you can send that stuff that's very helpful we don't have to sacrifice human life uh possibly human harm and it's uh it's a very useful tool it's just getting the administrators and uh, involved in it, getting the lawmakers involved in it, and uh, working it, you know, into the system as part of uh, this is what we do now. So, what new technologies and innovative solutions do you um, expect in the police department uh, being adapted in order to, you know, prevent crime? Um. Well, let's say here in Central Ohio, what we're doing now is, you know, we've got the uh, sensors for uh, uh, shots fired. Uh, we're using it at some of our large uh, facilities, uh, sporting events and so forth. Um, uh, the uh, facial recognition, we are using the uh, prior gun detection units so that we, we can still go up if we don't notice that somebody has a firearm, um, you know, off of the monitor that we're watching. Uh, we can dispatch a, you know, a, a team to go up and, uh, Tell the individual you're not allowed to come in with the firearm that you have in the, in your back waistband and they may look at you and say well how do you know we have that well we just know that you do you're not allowed in the facility that so you know um i think uh police departments are doing it. drones are becoming especially drones are becoming a very big thing for uh, uh technical response units not you know uh, first line responders typically don't have the availability or the access i should say don't have the access to that stuff right away. We may have to wait for a specialty team to uh, certain incidents to get there um, on that. But I, I do see a lot of it uh, being introduced uh, in, in the, you know, in not just uh, law enforcement and uh, fired EMS as well. And then uh, even in environmental cases, um, uh, dumping and stuff like that, uh, we're starting to see, you know, a lot of it uh, 
being implemented there. Of course, you know, the use of cameras is everywhere. Uh, pretty much wherever you go, you're being watched. I know, uh, like, I think it's uh, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I believe it is. Their entire uh, downtown is covered with cameras everywhere. Alleys, main roadways. I mean, you can't go anywhere and do anything without being on a camera, um, which I didn't know until a few years ago. But no, I, I believe it's... Um, the technology is slowly finding its place in law enforcement. David, would you quickly want to add something to that uh, pertaining to Canada and the rise of gun violence in Canada? How, what are you expecting, uh, you know, innovative solutions from technology uh, that would help in uh, crime prevention? Mm. Um, well, I mean, it's, it's hard to correlate uh, gun violence and to see if it is actually on the rise. I mean, um, uh, I would have to look at the research to, to, to say if there was actually empirical evidence to suggest that, you know, tougher gun laws uh, reduce gun violence. Uh, once again, um, it's not necessarily the gun that, uh, that causes the, the damage, it's the person who's wielding the gun. So it, that becomes a society issue as opposed to a, a gun issue. Um, uh, Canada is a big country and we have, uh, we have uh, a lot of borders. Um, so, you know, um, the illegal trafficking of gun is a world issue. It's not just a Canada issue. It's not a U.S. issue. It's not a, uh, you know, a North American or Western culture. It's a, it's a world we're so globally attached and, um, illegal trade, uh, is, uh, you know, the global market is we're, we're so closely connected. Um, so you want that fear, you know, that free trade agreements. Those are very important uh, uh, to the future of all society. Uh, however, can technology uh, make our society safer? Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, investing in that type of technology to uh, reinforce our borders for illegal illegal trafficking of people of people and um other people uh, of of uh weapons uh, that could be something a, a major investment for sure yeah so oh, thank you so much for sharing your views here uh does anybody have a question any of our panelists Trust me, I, I don't have a question, but I got a, a follow up, I think, with what David hit right on it. It's um, also you know, so often we, we blame it on the firearm. It's not the firearm. Um, the firearms are there. They've, they've always been there. Are there more of them? Yeah, there are. But we've got around the world, um, especially I can speak for the U.S., a mental health crisis. And uh, that's just starting to be recognized and accepted and evaluated, data collected on it, so forth. Uh, recently, the uh, shooting we had with the, the young kid that shot up at school and then killed himself, he left behind a letter. Uh, and, it, and it told us, you know, he was tired of being bullied. He had no friends. He had no girlfriend. He had no social life. Uh, so he was going to, you know, eat square up and, you know, make it right with society. But I think what we're doing, um, especially here in Ohio, some of the laws and across the U.S., some of the stuff we've passed recently to put more firearms on the street, so to say, will stop the bad guys. Um, that's not true. Um, and David hit right on, you know, enhancing our penalties and our laws. That doesn't work. Uh, we do it all the time. I do a lot of legislative work in our state house, working with the, uh, you know, lawmakers and so forth. And some of the ideas they come up with, it's, you know, it's kind of like I always bring up a, a, real, a real quick short story of, you know, Speeding tickets 25 years ago used to be $50. So we increased the fine to $300 and people still speed. Um, we have a death penalty here in America. People still kill. Uh, so it's, it's not about the firearm. I think we, we need to look at um, people as a whole and start addressing that. Possibly, you know, an indicator of a job. If you can come up with that, uh, you'll be welcomed all around the world. If you can predict what somebody's thinking um, by scanning their brain, that would work out well. Uh, it would help David and I know that when it came to a hostage situation, but um, that's what we don't have. And I think we need to quit trying to blame everything on firearms. Um, you know, with my military and law enforcement background, I'm all about firearms, but like David said, 
I'm worried about the person that has that firearm. So um, I have a question here. Can I? So you are saying that firearm does not impact. So this example that you gave of this person with mental health who killed a bunch of people in school and killed himself, if this person didn't have firearm, it will just be a mental health issue. He would not have affected other people and would have just killed himself. Don't you think there is a flaw in the argument there? Well, I think he's going to have access to firearms, whether you want them to or not. Um, especially here in America, they're everywhere. Uh, but as far as there mental go, health... There is, yeah, there you go. There is a flaw. So the ease of how firearms are available to individuals that is an issue we, we we for for car right like you know their car can be seen as a like you know almost like a, a it can kill so many people right because but then we control it so well people know how to need to know how to drive people need to follow how to drive right but then gun that we don't have any of those checks before selling guns to people. You're exactly right. In America, we do have what we call background checks. Um, if you're legitimately buying a firearm through a uh, firearm sales store. But other than that, we also, every weekend in America, we have what's called a, uh, uh, you know, a, a sale, a swap meet of firearms being sold and handed, you know, there's no accountability. There's no checks and balance. There's no background check. There's no age check. You got cash or a credit card. We'll buy or sell your firearms for you. Um, the, the mental health issue is, uh, this is just one aspect. Mental health issue, people can, as you mentioned, you can use a, a car, as we just seen here in America. Again, um, an individual just got sentenced to life in prison for running a car into a parade. Um, people with mental health issues, uh, some, some don't have it in them to take the lives of others, so they take their own lives um, by suicide in a variety of means they can do that. Uh, unfortunately, though, what we have is uh, mental health issues where people are to the point they're done with society. They're done being aggravated, irritated, picked on, labeled, stereotyped, whatever, and their only way out is to uh, retaliate with the use of a firearm and the types of firearms, especially uh, assault rifles or semi-assault, uh, you know, firearms, semi-firearms and so forth. Um, you, know, you can take a lot of people out at one time and it's almost for like a head count is what we, you know, some of the data in America that we've collected over the years, some of the stuff I've attended and training and so forth. It's, it's almost like, you know, these people that are going out and doing mass shooting, it's trying to Who's going to get the biggest number and be uh, hit the you know news that night? So yeah, those are some serious issues. That's a great question to bring up. I, I would agree with uh, with Tim, and it is a great question. And uh, I don't know that there is a reasonable answer to to that because uh, there's no way of identifying whether a person who is in crisis. Uh, that has access to a firearm uh, wouldn't cause death uh, if they didn't have access to a firearm. Um, it's always easy to look back and say that the firearm that they had access to was the cause of uh, the mass casualty. And certainly um, having access to a fully automatic rifle, um, you, you know, you can cause a lot of damage if it's in the right or wrong hands, I guess, uh, when we're talking about that. Um, but once again, uh, you know, to be able to to have a study to say, OK, if we take all the firearms away from the world, uh, does that uh, assist with uh, someone who is in crisis? Well, uh, there the question, I think, would would still have to be answered as to, you know, would that person find another means of causing um, harm to other people? Uh, and if we look at areas of mass casualty, uh, we do see that uh, people are becoming fairly creative in that area, whether it's edge weapon, uh, which is very evident in uh, uh, in England, uh, 
or use of vehicles uh, driving into you know crowds and so on. So, um, you know, it, it would certainly assist if if we had reasonable people out there wielding uh, reasonable you know options. Uh, unfortunately, we do have uh, people that are in crisis, whether they're, they're just not thinking rationally or according to how we interpret rational thought anyways. Uh, and I, I think that is the greater problem uh, for sure. Yeah. So if, if there is, so the, I mean, you don't need research to tell you that if there is an easy access to firearm, it's so much easier for a person to cause damage. Very true. No, you hit right, right on. The, the issue we run into is typically we don't know a person has a mental health issue until they act. Um, we want to try to understand that when we try to collect all the data we can from those that survive and live uh, that we can, you know, interview and hopefully we're getting the truth out of them to some some you know level of honesty anyways. Uh, but no, totally understand where you're coming from as far as the access of firearms. Um, realistically, uh, I believe in the U.S. there are fil a few billion firearms out on the market, and more are being, uh, you know, produced and put out on the market every day. Um, but even if, as David said, even if we take the firearms totally away, uh, well, we just seen in Vegas, guy didn't have a firearm, but he had a knife, killed a few people, um, something of that nature, um, a, a baseball bat with razor blades at it, nails sticking out of it. If somebody's wanting to cause uh, harm to another person, they'll find a way to do it. Um, unfortunately, right now, clear across the world, uh, firearms is the most accessible thing, and it takes out a large number of people, um, you know, immediately. Um, and that's some of the things that we need to look at. And, and I'm totally in agreement with you is there's got to be um, some kind of gun control. But at the same time, we have to be able to hopefully try to find out, you know, have a predicate pre or a, a predictor of, you know, what are the, the state of mind so that we can stop somebody, stop it before the act actually happens. Sorry, no, I don't want to. Go ahead. Yeah, so, so Rashmi, I know that we have crossed the time, but is there a room for one more question? Or... Sure, sure. Yes, yes. Please go ahead. So my, my question is actually to Job, right? Uh, uh, so Job, when you talk about AI, right, I mean, essentially what it is doing is replacing some human, right, who can do the same activity, right? And there is a cost to replacing a human. So how does this cost works out in the long run? Is AI comes out to be cheaper, uh, you know, another way to look at it is you can put people on the job who can do similar stuff for you, right? So how does it work out to be in the short and long term? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Nathan. Um, so, you know, you have to answer it uh, on how it has happened in the past. Uh, in short term, it is expensive because you are experimenting, you are letting it evolve uh, into something that you want uh, to be actionable. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, when the aircraft fit themselves with latest technology, it is expensive to begin with. But over a period of time, as you, uh, because the replicability of the software is much easier as compared to replicability of an expert, uh, they need to be developed or, you know, they need to have that much time. Uh, hence, it works out to be cheaper on a longer term. Um, so an aircraft, uh, you know, when it comes out, if it's not successful and it has all the bells and whistles, it will be very expensive. But if it is successful, uh, it will sell so much more uh, that the cost everything will be taken care of. So the software which it learns, uh, the training data, uh, you know, that has gone into it, to if you have to deploy it over hundreds and hundreds of sites, uh, that is that then becomes cost effective. But uh, before it can be deployed on hundreds and hundreds of sites, since it needs to undergo that much rigorous test, uh, it increases cost uh, you know, in the immediate one because there is no way you can replace a human by simply having an AI which is not being tested. So the testing period, how long does it take? Uh, depends on how much do you want the AI to, uh, if you want it to do a lot of things other than just detection and tracking. Uh, there is that much of time involved, training data involved. It will increase the cost. There will be no uh, you know, 
person who is uh, you know kind of being redundant by it but uh, i don't think there would be any person who will be ever be redundant by proper having technology it will be just throwing out so much data and it is more scalable uh, that over a longer period of time to have a mix of technology and expertise reduces the cost also increases the accuracy yeah, accuracy, uh, accuracy again depends on what is it that you want to do. If it's a, like I said, on detection and tracking. Yes, so I mean, uh, human uh, errors can be eliminated at least. Uh, on judgment side, no. I think uh, even attempting that is futile for AI as of today. Uh, on uh, trying to attempt a human judgment of expert, uh, it's it's futile. Uh, human judgment on eye uh, that you know if they haven't seen from certain angle, there are cameras at hundred, you know. Places, right? Human eyes too. There can be hundreds and billions of cameras uh, which is looking at the same thing. Yes, um, to that extent, uh, you have all this thing. But depends really on what you want to do for detection and tracking. Yes, you can think that it is. It can work with better than human eye accuracy. Uh, but on judgment side, uh, it, it would be ludicrous to even uh, give you an answer that AI is today anywhere on such a narrow. Uh, field which has a lot of expertise involved uh, that even AI will not never be able to understand the nuances and the um, downside of getting it wrong is huge. Uh, wouldn't even venture into you know, a scenario as of today. Gradually, over a period of time, since it's a uh, you know, growing technology, yes, there may be a future on some of those things. So that is uh, that is like a summarization as well because uh, I know that you want to shoot. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, you know, what Tim and Dave again and again mentioned, and I completely agree with it, that's the mix of, um, uh, you know, technologies which need to be there and let it evolve, give it time. Uh, maybe it will evolve into something very beautiful where uh, things are palatable to everyone. Maybe it won't, which is when the existing system is something which, uh, which needs to be there to support and help it expand. Thanks, Job. Any questions, anybody? Yeah, no, I just wanted to uh, comment on what he said about AI. Um, yeah, because, yeah, just just wanted to make sure that like, you know, because it was mentioned that we need something like AI to predict somebody's behavior. And uh, Nitin mentioned so rightly that it is not there and we have to be very careful because AI is usually, uh, the, it is as good as the data and the data that we have today, everybody knows that it is biased. So, you know, we need to be careful uh, and downside of getting the judgment wrong and then like implicating people wrongly might have negative consequences. 100% uh, especially because uh, the replicability is high. Uh, you know, if a, a biased person is not the one who will uh, who will be biased in the same way in the next scenario, right? uh, but uh, but a biased software, if deployed at 100 places, will remain continue to remain biased at all the 100 places. So yes, yep. uh, the burden of proof on AI to be robust uh, remains on the hands of the AI practitioners. Yeah. Uh, so if we have more questions from the audience, we can stretch this by five more minutes. If not, I think we can uh, wind it up now. We've exceeded by 20 minutes already. 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, the nuances that you get from years and years of working in the field is, uh, is never visible for uh, somebody who's not on, not in your shoes. Uh, thank you for sharing some of those stuff. Uh, you know, I feel that reached by uh, you know, kind of learning from you. Hopefully, uh, we'll have a chance to you know, meet and work together in the future. And Well, thanks, Rashmi. Job, David, is uh, great to meet you. Thanks to the audience for participating. Hope we got some information out there. And uh, if somebody's got something they want to share, um, I'm sure we uh, got some people here who want to collect some data.
on what you want to share. So uh, yeah, please give us those ideas. Um, the last comment of being a, a biased as far as to the data and that we may evaluate, I, I think that's totally correct. Um, by human nature, uh, we're all biased, we're all prejudiced, we all stereotype. Um, it is what it is. And should the day ever come that we can uh, have uh, or predict what somebody's thinking and what their actions are going to be. Um, I think it's a long way off. Um, it may be a welcoming thing. It may not be. Maybe, you know, maybe you don't want people looking into your brain and uh, being able to think what you're going to do <laughs> ahead of time or what you're thinking or so forth like that. Um, I'm not so sure I see that one coming, but uh, a very good uh, point that the, the lady made as far as um, being biased over the data that comes in and uh, actually trying to have uh, predictors of, you know, human behavior and so forth. But thanks everybody for inviting me and uh, I appreciate being here. It's a good show. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Yeah, thank you so much, friends. Uh, I really do appreciate your time. And uh, uh, it, it was a great conversation. And I think uh, any opportunity that we can have to information share uh, you know, you, you guys spoke about our experiences. Well, um, I, I have, I'm so ignorant when it comes to uh, technology and, and what it's capable of. So um, the more we speak and uh, the more we learn what each other's skill sets are, I think that's, uh, that's better for, for public safety as a whole. So I appreciate uh, the conversations. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. See you. All right, so if anybody has any questions, I think you can, uh, you have my email ID, all the attendees, please, you can always drop a question to me and we'll reach back to you. Thank you, Job. Thank you so much.